I think it's important to say that this webinar in particular is a part of a webinar series that we kicked off uh, late last year um, with the intent of learning from our brothers and sisters from the global south. What are the alternatives to the US militarized white supremacist police? Um, inspired by the calls to defund the police in the US, we really wanted to answer how do other countries deal with the questions of community safety, community accountability, and, and of abolition, which are such important themes right now. Um, how is the fight for abolition at home connected to the revolutionary movements across the globe for sovereignty? And what is possible now and in the future, given the example of Cuba and also of Nicaragua, which was our previous webinar. Um, but one of the main take backs for me from our sisters and compas in Nicaragua was, uh, was really that um, while we were looking for concrete models and experiences of community safety and police that, that were different from the one that we have here in the US, uh, they brought up the conversation of really who we need to be. How can we bring, um, how can we think about abolition and all of these questions in the context of revolutionary solidarity? And I think that in the US, uh, still unfortunately, sometimes my impression is that uh, the conversation for social justice here either goes in the direction of saviorism or of what we call in Portuguese umbiguismo. Umbigo is your belly button. So very self-centered, very like not looking at the, the global scenario and perspective. And I really hope that we can uh, put our faces up and like, you know, brace arms and learn together in solidarity. So this is an, the, the inspiration for this space, for it to be a space of transnational revolutionary solidarity and what is our role and what is possible uh, for us to learn together. So Yannette, we were gonna begin with you and then to be followed uh, by Sophia and then Aaron. And if each of you could take 15 minutes to do your presentation. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the invite. Uh, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my name is Yannepo Mariela, as you were mentioning. I'm second secretary of the Embassy of Cuba. Thank you so much to all the, all the organizers for the invite and to share a bit about how we see this approach uh, of the Cuban police, this meaningful topic in Cuba as well. As it is recognized, the police is one of the essential institutions uh, for the maintenance uh, of the security in the country. The way in which it is organized and legally regulated will acquire a special importance when it comes to its efficiency uh, in maintaining the security. To talk today uh, about the role and characteristics of the Cuban police, it is essential in our case to look back to our history, to the origins and evolution of this institution of the government. During the colonial period, uh, the police was characterized by a strong repressive tendency through the different mechanisms present in the Spanish metropolis at the time for colonization purposes at the service of the colonial classes at that uh, time. Until the end of the 19th century, uh, Cuba was governed, as you might know, by the laws and the Spanish administration. The police at the time exercised a primary function of repressive nature. Their task was to discover the crimes and search for and arrest the criminal, basically like that. However, during the years of the first period uh, of the wars for the Cuban independence from Spain, Within the insurgent camp, what we know as the Mambises, some elements uh, of control with police functions were also developed. But unlike the repressive nature of the military institutions created by the colony, these uh, emerged with a marked social character. During this uh, insurrectionary period, the police tasks were carried out by prominent officers and soldiers with a high prestige within Mambisa troops. But a setback on this approach was experienced again during the neocolonial period, where the functions and the structure of the police institutions varied depending on the interests of each government in power. With the rise of Fulgencio Batista's dictatorship to power, the police and the army became basically murderous machines. The national police began to be used to repress strikes and 
uh, student movements uh, through the use of water hoses, sticks, rubber bands, cables. In this way, the police were moving away from their function of fighting crime and, pro and protecting citizens to become an apparatus of political repression. It is well known and documented the corruption and brutality of the police body under the Batista dictatorship. Now, um, the current National Revolutionary Police uh, of Cuba has its direct heritage from the rebel army and the rebel police. He was born in close uh, collaboration with the citizens, supporting the triumph and consolidation of the Cuban Revolution. We cannot talk about the nature of the current Cuban National Revolutionary Police without referring to these rebellious roots for two reasons. It was in the fights for independence at Sierra Maestra with the birth of the rebel police, where a humanist conception was born in preservation of the internal order. And second, because it were those same rebels who founded, after the triumph of the revolution, a police of a new type that acted in the defense of the common social good at the triumph of the Cuban revolution. Through this stage, the police had the full support of the organized population, reinforced by the creation of, uh, for example, revolutionary militias, the Federation of Cuban Women, the committees for the defense of the Cuban revolution. The police themselves being part of the uniformed people who defended the interests of the Cuban revolution at the time. Since then, the Cuban police has implemented some aspects from the community oriented models with an increase of the preventive and prophylactic functions. This way, its original uh, authoritarian and repressive role decreases and the proximity with the community increases. Changes uh, continued being implemented in Cuba. For example, in, in 1969, after the celebration of the Forum of Internal Order, Cuba drew on experiences and opinion of specialists of, of other countries as well. This led to changes in the structure of how to fight crimes. In 1971, sorry, it was implemented at the grassroots levels, what we call the head of the sector, still there. This is a figure, uh, it's an example of the need to link this institution, I mean the police, with the people, highlighting the community work and the close collaboration and exchange of information with the goal of preventing crime and helping in the social reintegration of those who committed crimes. The figure of the head of sector becomes relevant uh, also in favor uh, of minimizing the causes and conditions that favor the commission of criminal acts, social indisciplines, and development of antisocial behaviors as well. The head of the sector, together with another figure that is the juvenile officer, also has, also, uh, has took an important, an important role uh, working with minors with conduct disorder by uh, recommending to the families, to their schools, and all the factors that have a role in the development of the personalities of those uh, minors. Another effort I can refer uh, to bring the police closer to the community are the police stations. There is one in almost each municipality and the head of sector are located in what is known as the discovery and community work area within the, 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 the police station. Also a project named uh, a station and community began to be implemented in approximately 2007. This implied a series of modifications, not only from architectural point of view, but also from organizational one within the police stations as well to achieve the effective fulfillment of this uh, purpose. Also, there are representatives from the police in the Commission of Prevention in the Popular uh, Council, which is a low level structure that we have in our representative uh, system. I'd like to highlight uh, the importance of the integration of the police officer with the community in order to promote preventive work, the continuous training uh, of the police body in fundamental areas, such as respect for human rights above all, 
and the content assessment of police station of police actions by citizens through the social control mechanism that we have. Of course, many things can still you know, be done. More recently, projects have been carried out in Cuba to continue improving the institution of the police. One of the most uh, comprehensive was uh, conducted in 2012. It is called the Alma Mater Project and was carried out in close coordination and the support with um, scientific and academic institutions in Cuba, of course, universities among them. The ideas uh, or the idea was to improve the police from how they could better perform their law enforcement functions, uh, how to continue increasing the preventive role, also their participation in the criminal proceeding within a framework of the laws, among other aspects. Significant uh, recommenda recommendations, I can say, from the several investigations has been considered and implemented by the police. Now, how is police in Cuba accountable to the Cuban people is one of the other questions I was invited to, to talk in, in this uh, panel. There are different mechanisms in Cuba available for, for the citizens to control one way or the other uh, the police actions. The head of sector, for example, most participate in the community meetings where the delegates of popular power usually deliver their accountability reports. In this space, the head of sectors receive considerations related to the police actions and also offers appropriate orientations and guidance. There are also figures established in the police stations to which uh, people turn in case of irregular behaviors on the part of the agents. Also at the municipal uh, level in our representative system, there is a commission within the municipal assembly of people's power with, uh, which is in charge of receiving, basically receiving complaints from the population about the police and channels them to the station. There is also an in the directorate it is subordinated to the Ministry of Interior of Cuba. This directorate is not part of the police. It is called the Citizens Advice Organo. In Cuba, we call Organo de Atención a la Ciudadanía. This is in charge of receiving the complaints also and suggestions that the populations transmit to, in, to it. They open, an, they open an investigative process in cases that require it, or also request, request explanation directly directly from the accused police. This body must respond to the subject who made the complaint. These mentioned organic bodies, given a bridge by the agents uh, on any of their functions of, uh, in the administrative field, can apply <clears throat> disciplinary measures that range from warning to a separation from the institution. Also, the police are subject to an external control by the prosecutor's office in Cuba. This specific control operates with respect to violations of legal uh, connotations. The prosecutor's office and the military courts are the bodies that have competence to punish the commission of crimes by the police forces, each within its sphere. In the criminal law and also in the military criminal law, there are um, typified the, the conducts uh, that the police can conduct, can carry out in their functions. And because of that, they can have uh, legal consequences in the criminal uh, courts. Very important is that also by law, the performance uh, of the Cuban police has limits that are legal guarantees for the people. In the article number 42 of the Cuban constitution, uh, it is prohibit any kind of discrimination. People must be treated as equals under the laws. This has been present in every constitution that the Cuban people have voted for, for and uh, overwhelmingly approved through all these years. Also, the new constitution uh, expanded the guarantees for due process. Among others, it includes the presumption of innocence principle that has had recognition in our legal system for decades. With the approval of the new constitution uh, that was enacted in 2018, this fundamental right has a constitutional protection now. Also have uh, constitutional recognition, the habeas corpus 
that allows any citizen to report any illegal detention based uh, on the laws. This in general is uh, the approach uh, of Cuban uh, uh, on, on the police you know, model. It's not a specific model, but a one that includes you know, um, principles from different ones. I would prefer to, to leave it here so my colleagues uh, on the panel can share on their experience on this topic, and I will be very uh, open to, to questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yannette. Oh, and within your time, thank you. I meet, I meet the time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. I've, I've got to uh, describe myself. I'm Cindy Domingo. I'm the chair of US Women in Cuba Collaboration. <laughs> so, <laughs> and with that, I would like to introduce Sophia Elijah. All right, well, first I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate. So I want to focus my remarks on my observations from the standpoint of being a Black woman in the United States who's been a political activist for decades and the um, experiences and observations I've made over time from my trips to Cuba. I should start with saying I'm a criminal defense lawyer by training and I am also a former law professor. I taught for almost 20 years teaching law students how to defend people accused of crimes here in the United States. My first trip to Cuba was in the mid eighties and I was struck, oh, I would say within about the first hour and a half that everything, everything was very, very different in Cuba and it took me a while to understand kind of what that intangible difference was that shaped literally everything else that I saw and observed in the country. And in particular, I was interested in studying the criminal injustice system. Well, in the United States, it's called, I call it the injustice system, but I want to study Cuba's approach to the criminal justice system, policing and um, prisons because I, I do a lot of work around prisons and abolition here in the United States. And I guess after several trips, I finally asked some of my um, colleagues, my Cuban colleagues, well, you know, I've seen the police, um, but it seems like you have a very low arrest rate because I've never seen any arrests in, in Cuba. And so they looked at me kind of quizzical Say, but I, I, Fee, I thought you had, you know, thought you had traveled around Cuba quite a bit, and and I had. So I said, but but I've never seen the police arrest anybody. And I finally realized the reason that I thought I had not seen the police arrest anybody is because the way people are arrested in the United States is so dehumanizing. It's so physically aggressive. It's uh, of a frontal attack, basically, that um, that's the only way that I knew to understand what an arrest looked like. When I realized in Cuba, an arrest could look kind of like a few people standing around talking about a baseball game, because there's no, there didn't seem to be any aggression involved in it. And I finally understood that that was because the police were not viewed as the enemy of the people or as an occupying force or as, a, as someone, as a black person living in the United States, having witnessed my entire life, terrorism and trauma from the um, police, it was in the US, it was very hard for me to kind of wrap my brain around this, this different view, this different vision of the police. I would hear Fidel Castro speak about another world as possible, um, but it took, a number of visits before I could stretch my brain to understand that, that that phrase, another world is possible, really encompassed everything. And that the reason that the experience with the police in Cuba is so very different from the experience in the United States is because in Cuba, the people and the needs of the people are central to all decisions and everything that happens in the country. And as a person who grew up in the United States, that was a completely foreign concept because 
all the policies, all the decisions, everything that happens here seem to be focused about around money and property and not around the people and the people's needs as being the, um, the priority. And um, that really, uh, it, it took a complete embrace and understanding of that to be able to start to understand how the criminal justice system is set up in Cuba. And so after a few years of, of kind of trying to peel the onion of my indoctrination in the United States, I had opportunities to visit actually two prisons in Cuba and also visit courts and observe trials. And one of the things that struck me was that um, there's not one judge, there's a panel of judges for lower offenses, you have a three person panel and for higher offenses, you have a five person panel, but the majority of the people on each of those panels are lay people. So if it's a three person panel, two of the three people are not lawyers. Well, that completely blew my mind because, you know, as a lawyer growing up in, um, raised and working in the United States, um, lawyers are falsely believed to know everything and being the only ones um, really um, quote unquote fit to um, adjudicate how the laws should be carried out. So the fact that lay people sat on the courts in Cuba really spoke to this larger system in which of course the police fit, but how the entire system is set up to support and um, be participatory by the people. Um, another aspect that I found um, that really struck me in Cuba was the overarching sense of safety. Um, I think all the women in particular who are listening will appreciate the fact that there's not too many places in the US that you would consider walking by yourself at about three or four o'clock in the morning without a fear that you were at risk of your um, physical safety. But yet in Cuba, that's common. There's no worries that I ever had at any time of the morning, noon or night to go walking by myself down a completely dark street um, in central Havana or old Havana without, and I, I never had to worry about my safety. And it's not because the streets were lined with police who were protecting me. It's just the entire um, society was one primarily of law abiding and not, um, you didn't have to risk physical assault. Um, that's a very, very different experience. But now I'm gonna turn in specific to what I'm sure many of your listeners are focusing on is, and that is, um, do you have, and I was on a, a webinar not too long ago, do you have experiences like George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Oscar Grant, and the names are like too long, to, there's too many to list all of them um, in, in Cuba. It's a completely different experience, completely different experience. I'm a mother of two sons, two black men um, here in New York City. There's not a day, even now that they're in their thirties, there's not a day that goes by when they go out the door that I don't worry as to whether or not they're going to be safe in the streets. And I'm not worried about their peers. I'm worried about the police and whether or not they will be shot, assaulted, or just never make it home. Um, that is a constant fear. And I have yet to meet a single soul in Cuba who's had that experience, who knows what that fear is. Um, that in and of itself speaks volumes. It speaks volumes that there's just not that kind of um, repression and assault, because that kind of daily stress um, takes its toll. Not only does it take its toll on the psyche, it takes it, its toll on your physical being. And I'm happy to say that my Cuban brothers and sisters don't experience that. And I hope that there will come a day in the US where no one has to experience that either. Um, I think I may stop here, Cindy, um, because I want to make sure that we have plenty of time to, um, for audience participation. And I'm sure that there, whatever I forgot to cover will come up in the Q&A. Thank you, Sophia. You know, I've had similar experience. Uh, 
and um, in my times to Cuba. And I want to just tell a brief story before I let Aaron speak. Is uh, my first time in Cuba was on uh, during International Women's Day, and one of the women of color was out walking uh, along the Malacan, which is the wall uh, that surrounds the ocean or, or is the border to the beach and and the city of Havana. And a police approached uh, the friend who's a woman of color and she got scared because she has had experiences in the United States with police and it was late. And the police said to her, happy International Women's Day. <laughs> and and uh, she was so shocked. And uh, that was her first experience on her first night there. And she has never forgotten it. So it was a wonderful experience. So with that, I would like to introduce Erin Dixon, my good friend. Thank you, Cindy. And uh, thank you, everybody that has spoken thus far. And uh, thanks for asking me to uh, participate in, in this. Um, now, I've never been to Cuba, so I can't speak uh, about any experience there. Uh, but I can speak to about my experience here in America as a as a black male, and uh, and I can speak uh, somewhat to the history of America um, and the history of America, which is uh, very much based upon white supremacy, uh, based upon <coughs> racism, based upon um, capitalism. Um, and um, greed and all kinds of evil things. That's what this country is based upon and lies, the most important thing. Uh, and that's what our police department has always been based upon. And everybody is familiar that the history of, of, of the police policing in America uh, started with the uh, slave patrols um, and uh, making sure that uh, the slaves were captured who were uh, escaping for their freedom, uh, making sure that Native American people uh, were not uh, um, um, mingling in the towns. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's from that point on, it has been a, uh, a war, a war between people of color and the establishment, which was protected by the police. You know, ever since I can remember, I can remember developing a fear of the police. And uh, every time you see the police, um, you know, you begin to, uh, you know, get stressed out and get, and, and, and are afraid. Um, and so I saw this all the time I was growing up. Uh, which is one of the things that led me to join the Black Panther Party. Um, and the Black Panther Party was formed primarily uh, in defense of the community against the police. And this is why the Black Panther Party created police patrols, armed police patrols, to protect the people in the Black community and to educate people in the Black community that they had a right to defend themselves as stated in the second amendment of the constitution of the United States. Um, so because of our stance, the Black Panther Party came under <clears throat> ferocious attack by the government, the FBI and local police departments. And I would say over from 1967 to about 1970, there were over 20 members of the Black Panther Party that were killed by the police and by the FBI. Um, and, you know, Fred Hampton uh, was one of the most notable figures uh, who was murdered by the FBI and Mark Clark. And I could go on and name so many other people uh, who were also killed by the police department. So, um, <clears throat> And this trend has continued. Um, and I think that we really have to understand the culture of America, which is has a lot to do with the culture of the police department. And so how do we change the culture of America 
so that we can create a more uh, humane police department? How can we make America more humane uh, so that we can have a more humane police department? So there's, there's a lot of layers to that. There's a lot of layers in terms of the unions, the police unions that control the police and set policy, because policy plays a big role in uh, how uh, police interact with people in the community. How do we change those police unions? Um, how do we change the basic nature of, of learning how to teach people with human dignity? I have had a time an opportunity to travel uh, to many other countries around the world. And I have seen in most of those countries where people do not have that disconnect with the police department that we have here in America. Um, so, you know, that, that, is, that is our challenge and that is our struggle right now. One of the uh, projects that the Black Panther Party started in 1969 was community control of police. And what we wanted to do was uh, have the people in the community be more involved and have a say so in the practices of the police departments that were patrolling in our communities, particularly have a role in the hiring and the firing of the police and have a role in, uh, in the um, discipline of uh, police officers who were involved in uh, misconduct. And uh, over the last uh, 15 years since we have been in war uh, in the Middle East, the police departments have become more uh, militarized. They become more militarized, not just through the weapons, uh, military weapons that people uh, that police departments were able to uh, procure, but they have also been militarized by uh, people who had been in the military themselves, who now found themselves serving in the police department in mostly black communities. And, you know, we're talking about people who probably most of them have some level of post-traumatic stress syndrome, uh, and they're very much in a war mentality and then they come back and they're put on the streets and they're and and they they wage that same war against people in the community so um we have we have a tremendous challenge ahead of us in terms of um uh, of, of understanding how we want to move forward in terms of making the police department more accountability um and i definitely uh, agree with um um, that there's too much money that goes in the police department, just as too much money that goes into the military. Um, and so we need to not only defund the police, but we also need to talk about defunding the military because you can't talk about defunding one without talking about defunding the other because they both go hand in hand and arm in arm. Um, but I, it, it is still my position that I think that we need to have more control over the police departments because you can take away uh, a, a large portion of their funding, but you still don't have control over them. You know, they can still hire the racist police chief. They can still hire, uh, continue, with, continue with their practices. So unless community is involved in the hiring and, um, and, and having a say-so in the conduct and the discipline of the police department. I think th those are the things we should also be talking about. So I'm gonna end there, thank you. Are the lay people on the judge panel in Cuba in lieu of a jury? And in Cuba, is it true that defense attorneys do not have the right to do their own investigation they must rely on the prosecutor's investigation and conviction need not be beyond all reasonable doubt. Conviction rate in Cuba is a result, is a uh, extremely high result. I think you were mentioning in your presentation about the lay, you know, people in the, in the, in the judge uh, court. I think that uh, what people were asking is, is that persons are, like the jury here in the United States, 
you know, that we have a, a completely different, you know, system of, of law. In the case of Cuba, these people we call the West Lego, you know, uh, Lego judge, are the persons that are, you know, um, regular people, as you, as you were referring, are not judges, are not lawyers. Their main role is to, you know, to apport, to provide the judge with uh, a more, you know, general or humane, you know, vision uh, for them to take that into account, you know, at the time to uh, um, enforce, I mean, uh, provide the, the judgment. You know, that the judges are just, um, you know, based, they are judged, um, sorry, uh, must be based on the law. Specifically, they should look at this. And those pe people are the ones that provide with this more humane vision for them not to uh, probably apply, you know, over, you know, represented uh, judgment in Cuba. This is, I think it's a, it's a fortress, uh, I would say for our, you know, court system in, in, in Cuba. I know if you would like to add something else. Yes, I, I would love to respond because uh, the question reminds me of some of my early visits to Cuba and when <laughs> I first went to um, observe court proceedings and I kept waiting for the jury to come into the courtroom. And then finally, when, you know, when the day was over and the jury had not come into the courtroom and I had watched many trials, I kept wondering, well, what happened? And so there isn't a jury in Cuba. As, as Janet said, it's a completely different system, mm -hmm. right? And for people who've been trained in the law in the United States, it generally takes a very long time to process, to really like mm -hmm. close the door on what you were, um, what you learned in the US as far as how the legal system operates here, because we tend to think that it's the only way that things can happen and not understand that there are other systems that are functioning quite well in other parts of the world. And that just because they, you can't draw a dotted line between what happens in the United States and what happens in Cuba doesn't mean the Cuban system doesn't function and function quite well. And, in many respects functions much better. So the not having a jury is one of them. And the, the second question about what defense lawyers can do and who they depend on for the investigation and can't do their own independent investigation. So as a criminal defense lawyer myself, I had the exact same um, experience and thoughts when I first started observing. I felt like, oh my goodness, um, you know, uh, people must be railroaded and defense lawyers are just puppets and their hands are tied because I was, I've been trained in this adversarial system. That's what the US um, criminal justice system is. It's an adversarial system. The system in Cuba is not an adversarial system. And the only thing I can say is you can say that 400 times to, um, lawyers from the United States, that the system in Cuba is not an adversarial system. They can't process it. It just can't process it because it's all we know, right? And so it takes quite a while to see that, you know, the sky has not fallen in Cuba because their court system is based on a different system. It functions quite well. And so this concept that the defense lawyers rely on the investigations done by the prosecutors. Well, the prosecutors, are their job is not an adversarial one. The defense lawyers' job is not an adversarial one in the courts in Cuba. There's, and I know this is going to sound just like almost like blasphemy to U.S. trained lawyers, mm -hmm. but there is this quote unquote joint quest for the truth in the courts in Cuba which I know, I, I can't even believe I was able to, to articulate that because for a very long time, despite the fact that I believed in what I saw in Cuba, I couldn't quite get this quest for the truth idea. That was probably far down on my, my, um, my list of understandings in Cuba because I had been so indoctrinated that only an adversarial system could work. So I hope that that responded yeah. uh, adequately to the question. Sure, I would like to add something, <laughs> probably. Do you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you, you, 
Yes, uh, well, you are right, and your observation has been very accurate, uh, Sophia. Just would like to add just something is uh, technicalities that, you know, are in, in, in the laws in Cuba. That's why many people, you know, got the idea that the, the attorneys have no role. Uh, and this is, you know, no completely like that. The case is that the prosecutor uh, it has the main role at the beginning in the, in the system in, in Cuba because has been empowered, you know, by the people to conduct these prosecutor actions against the, the criminals. Then through the process, there is a specific moment when it is applied, you know, measures to the, uh, to the criminal in this case, or well, is presumed innocent, but the, the, the alleged, you know, um, criminal, where the lawyer can get to the process and practice, you know, their own proofs, take their own evidence, and these can be taken there, you know, after that to the jury. So uh, it, is, it is true that at the beginning, you know, since the process haven't been, uh, hasn't been open completely, at this very beginning, the, the attorneys do not have like a, the, uh, a broader possibility to practice, proof, to access to the record. But right after this moment, is established, you know, by, by law and, and the and the prosecutors in this case, then the lawyer can, you know, access to the uh, files, to the records, practice proof, you know, and, and take this proved evidence to the to the court. That that's the the I, how is established in our procedure, criminal procedure in Cuba. But it's not, you know, exact to say that have no role at all. Yes, have, but at a later moment in the process. It's something very specific. Yeah, yeah I was Thank going you. to say, yeah, I'm sorry. Anna. I was also no, going to ahead. say that the system in the United States, as a defense lawyer, you don't trust the prosecutor. I see. And prosecutors build their careers on locking people up. I mean, there's, there's no other way to, to understand it. And so there's tremendous incentive in the United States for prosecutors to violate the laws and the rights of the defendant to build their own careers, to build their own track record. In the Cuban system, that just doesn't exist. So the, the trust in what the prosecutor is doing is held by the people in a way that you just can't appreciate in the United States because it just doesn't happen here. Yeah, I, I, I see the difference because also in Cuba, um, if I may, uh, the prosecutors have um, beyond that uh, of being, you know, uh, with the defendant, have other roles, also civil ones, to protect, for example, children, to protect, you know, people with disabilities, uh, also to enforce the legal, you know, uh, the, the legality of the process. That's why the prosecutor in Cuba, you know, is, as you said, is, is seen, you know, a uh, different one, probably because of that, because the functions are broader, uh, also in civil cases. Uh, the prosecutor have a main role in order to protect, uh, for example, the rights of the children, the rights of the people with, with, with disabilities, etc. That's why it probably is seen uh, a bit different. And thank you for sharing that, your view about this. Thank you. Um, I, I want to stay on this topic just for a little bit before we move to more of what's happening in the US. There are more particular questions around this. So what, if any, is the role of plea bargaining in Cuba? And how are judges chosen? And are lawyers, civil defense or criminal defense, are they appointed or are they hired? Yeah. Well, uh, and this is a, a some we, we call cultural preventive, you know, uh, measure uh, in Cuba, in order to uh, ensure, you know, that the persons will uh, be permanent and fulfill the whole process. Uh, talking about how the judges uh, in Cuba are, you know, higher, you know, you should go through a complete process uh, at the university, of course. Then you should, you know, um, go through. Uh, at some point so, through exams in Cuba, and then you can be, you know, open to 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 participate uh, uh, as a judge in the different, you know, levels 
of our legal systems. You know, we have uh, courts at municipality levels, provincial ones, and the Supreme Court. Of course, depending on, on the experience that these judges develop as well can be accessible to these three different uh, uh, levels. There's one last question. Do Cuban people accept the judgments and sentences as being fair or is their belief that the system is not just and fair? In my travels and talking with lay people, professional people, people of all walks of life, I've heard no complaints about the court system, none. People might complain about standing online to get their ration card filled, <laughs> but not, I haven't heard complaints about the court system. And, you know, I realized you, the question, if I could go back for a second about the plea bargaining. Mm -hmm. yeah, my observation of what was happening in, in court was that the defendant was more interested and more invested in having the judges understand their broader circumstances as opposed to um, challenging whether or not they were guilty of what they had been charged with or whether or not the prosecutor had presented the evidence accurately. <coughs> Excuse me. It was, I didn't observe that um, that there was a lot of, I'll use the word suspicion for one of a better word, suspicion as to whether or not the prosecutor was fairly and accurately reporting what had taken place. So my observation was that the defendant and defense counsel um, were more um, focused on presenting mitigating factors that um, explained more the circumstances of the defendant put the defendant's actions in context and those mitigating factors would play a role in consideration with respect to what kind of sentence would be um, handed out. So that in and of itself, I think it's relevant when we talk about plea bargaining because the plea bargaining context in the United States is all tied to the fact that prosecutors will seek harsher punishment if someone doesn't admit their guilt. It's a completely different mindset in the Cuban court system. That's what I wanted to add. Yes, yes, I, I completely uh, agree that I, as, as I was referring at some point at the beginning, uh, in Cuba is, you know, the way this, this figure, you know, doesn't have uh, any role as in the United States. That's why I was referring that the, the idea is that people, you know, be present in the, through the whole process. And uh, that's why we, we, we do not have, you know, this uh, situation in Cuba of plea bargains. We, this play no role, you know, in, in our system. You know, people in Cuba go through a through process and after the, the judgment, as you have in, in here in the United States, we have the remedies. If people are not, you know, uh, agree uh, with, the, with the judgment, they can, you know, appeal to the different the ones. But uh, for, it's a rule, they, they go through the whole process, no plea bargains. And you know, and Yana, I, I realized I didn't explain it. It could come to pass that the prosecutor will come into court and say, I don't have enough evidence to mm -hmm. show that this person is guilty. Now we can't, we don't, we rarely see anything like that happen in the United States, but mm -hmm. it's, it can happen in Cuba. It's not uncommon. So when we're thinking about this kind of this mm -hmm. adversarial thing and what role the defense counsel has, um, the prosecutor's role in, in the Cuban court system is just so different than what we see as the prosecutor's role here in the US. I'd like to bring Aaron into the discussion. And Eleni, um, feel free to interact if you have uh, some contributions because you have the experience from Brazil. Um, and so uh, we want to move to, uh, in the U.S., how do we use the momentum of recent protests against racial violence by police forces to achieve real change in policing? And is there any one lesson from policing in Cuba that could carry over directly into these efforts for change in the United States? <clears throat> You're asking me that? Yeah. <laughs> First, you, Aaron, and uh -huh. Sophia and Alini, if you'd like to contribute. Well, um, I, I, well, first of all, let me say that I think um, 
when Biden was elected president that uh, I don't think there was enough um, uh, pressure put on him to hire someone uh, over the Justice Department. Um, and the, unfortunately, the person that he did hire is pro-police. So um, I don't know how much change we're going to be able to see from that. But that would have been something that I think the momentum of the movement should have really focused on and making sure that Biden elected someone that the people had chosen. Uh, so with that, that said, um, I think now that we know who has been chosen, I think that uh, there should be a tremendous amount of pressure put on him and it should be a um, demand that we want to see in terms of the change of policing in America. Um, and also I think on the, uh, uh, on the local level, um, we have to be, uh, you know, we have an opportunity, particularly in Seattle, uh, we have an opportunity to do some amazing things in terms of um, holding the police responsible. And so, um, you know, we, we, have to, we have to create a list of demands or we have to come up with a, um, some, um, what we would like to see, you know, um, and I think we could learn a lot from Cuba. We could learn a lot from the example in Cuba because we have to understand the people that we're dealing with, the people who run, run and make the policies and the changes, they don't have the ability to, uh, to vision what we're talking about and how, how to implement it. They, they, don't, they don't have it, you know, to be quite realistic. Uh, we saw that with the Black Panther Party. One of, one of the things that the Black Panther Party did uh, really successful was uh, be able to deliver social services. And we really set an example on how to deliver social services. And we, and we opened up our free medical clinics, opened up our breakfast programs and our legal aid clinics. All of those programs were adopted, uh, adopted by the uh, government. And so uh, we have to be creative in terms of what our vision is for policing in our cities and policing in our community and travel to places like in Cuba and travel to places like in Norway, where in Norway, um, they've owned, the last time they killed somebody, the police was about 15 years ago. And the police are not allowed to carry their weapons. Their weapons are locked in their cars and they have to get uh, permission uh, if they have to use it. So there's a lot of things that we could learn that, and, and, I, and that's one of the things that we did in the Black Panther Party is we learned from other countries. We learned from other communities around the world so that we could uh, come up with creative, creative ideas uh, in terms of how to solve the problem. So, uh, you know, those are some of the things that I, I think that uh, the organizers and young people should think about is, is creating a vision of what we're asking for and even in, in, in some ways, even implementing some of those things, you know, um, you know, providing security in our own community, uh, coming up with our own 9-11 service. Uh, since we know we can't call 9-11 because they'll send the police out and somebody's going to get killed and usually it's us. So then we have to, and, and if they're not going to address that, then we can, we should be thinking about creating our own uh, 911 service. Uh, think about creating our own community control uh, of people in our community. And, and maybe uh, the examples that we show could, uh, could help the government to be involved in, in funding some of those things. So, uh, you know, those are the things that I, I, I think that, uh, that we should fo uh, focus on while we have this momentum uh, behind us. Thank you, Aaron. Sophia, would you like to speak to it or Alini? Yes, I, I definitely would like to speak to it. Um, I'm heartened by the, the call to defund the police, um, but I think that we um, are um, kind of short-sighted in the call to defund the police. 
And that is because unless we're going to completely overhaul the system, defunding the police is just one manifestation of all the failures of the system that has not worked for the people for centuries in this country. So until we're going to create a system that is people-centered in every aspect, then you're going to have, if it's not the police, there's gonna be some other system that is going to horribly fail the people. So we have to do a hard look and be willing to throw all the silverware up in the air and start over with the new melody. Otherwise, we're still going to have the same old song. Could, could I just uh, jump in there? And, and I, I uh, agree with you 100%, 100% because this system is rotten. Yeah. You know, and, and we, I, we're not going to be able to change this system unless we tear it down. Now, the question is, how are we going to tear it down? You know, it could be done in a variety of ways, but I think that's one of the things that we have to look at is how are we going to, uh, how, how can we change the system so that it is a more humane system? And, it, and it's rotten in every single category, you know, from the educational system uh, the prison system, the uh, the uh, uh, medical care system, uh, you know, in every aspect, because it's it's the, the foundation that it's built on is is a rotten foundation, you know. It's a foundation that's been built upon lies and lies and lies, uh, and unfortunately, American people, as we are seeing today, they are very susceptible to any kind of lies because they don't know they don't know what the truth is because they've never been taught the truth. So I just wanted to throw that out there. <laughs> so I mean just to wrap up, this is like I think the peak of our webinar and like why spaces like these are so important for us to reflect. Uh, the call for defunding the police is not necessarily um, adversarial, right, to a call for abolishing the capitalistic exploitative system that we live under, that is, that we're referring to, and that's so, like, so much of the status quo, the status quo and the culture of American existence. I do hope that, like, spaces like this can provide us with the, the language and the opportunity to learn from each other how the end goal is not just to defund the police, the end goal is abolition of this capitalistic uh, exploitative, white supremacist, patriarchal, ableist, uh, you name it, LGBTQ phobic system that we're all being exploited for. Uh, what is really difficult about doing that in the US is um, everything else around it, right? So when we talk about defunding the police, we defund the police, but how about the, the, the communal process of deciding and having sovereignty over uh, what's gonna what justice is gonna look like if it's not a criminal justice system? And uh, how are we gonna hold community accountability and transformative justice when we barely have a decent concept of community in this country, right? Like, I, my life here is just so different from my life in the US, in, in Brazil, and I have my basic needs met here. In Brazil, I was always just like hustling to get the basic needs met, but I had community. And I, I do feel like I'm really grateful that I have found that in some activist circles. But in general, our lives are set up in a way to follow a very individualistic path and one that is not interdependent. So um, how can the weekend comes and, and people are concerned with getting their camping gear or going to the next new brewery and uh, Instead, like in Brazil, I know I was just in another webinar with my comrade, my best friend from college and uh, someone who introduced me to the idea of uh, a feminist anti imperialistic uh, anti militarist type of work, uh, where they were talking about a popular education school that prepares students for the SAT, while also bringing uh, class and mass consciousness, like, and that's a public service that like, the only thing that I can see as a parallel is the Black Panther Party model of producing these basic social t services and walking the path as we go and using that as a tool for mass consciousness. And I do hope that the defund campaign is not just another campaign, but like I see so much potential for intergenerational community um, accountability, transformation, relationship building, transnational solidarity, because it's not just Black Lives Matter, it's Vidas Negras important, right? And 
and there's a lot there for us to learn. So uh, I don't think that that conversation would have been possible five years ago when I came to the U.S. the first time. And I'm really, really honored to be a part of that and to be a part of bringing all of you incredible people together to to teach and learn together. So that's what thank I you, Eleni. Thank you. So I just want to close out, um, you know, just this conversation has just been great. Uh, I've been going to Cuba for 20 years and have been there almost 25 times and have never had a, such a, a learning experience as this today uh, about, the, um, about Cuba's uh, system in terms of policing and criminal justice. So I wanna thank you all today and I hope our organizers, I think we're gonna go about five or six minutes over time and I hope our organizers will let us do that because one of the reasons we do this workshop is because we have to change our US foreign policy towards Cuba. As Sophia uh, has laid out, going to Cuba is an experience and I promise to take you there, Aaron and Alini. <laughs> Uh, because it opens up your mind. It challenges you at every step, every moment to think differently about how we could build a better world possible and how we could transform our society to build that better world. One that reflects our values and principles of peace, freedom, equality, and a society based on human rights. So I wanna just go over a few things that you can do to build a stronger Cuba solidarity movement here in the United States. We have a 60 year old blockade against Cuba. It is inhumane, it, it, it's against international law and uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo as his parting shot at Cuba, put Cuba back on the, uh, the list of terrorist nations. And this is just a violation of Cubans' uh, uh, right for self-determination and national sovereignty. The Biden-Harris administration has committed to a re-engagement policy towards Cuba uh, after the four years of the harshening of the 60-year-old blockade against Cuba. Uh, un under the uh, former Obama administration, steps were taken to begin the process of normalizing relationships between the U between US and Cuba, but it will take an act of Congress to lift that 60 year old blockade. So we want to lobby the new administration to keep their promise, but as a first step in re only as a first step of re-engagement and normalizing um, uh, US foreign policy towards Cuba. And we want to build a new foreign policy towards Cuba, not go back to the same old, same old, but we want a Cuba policy that's based on mutual respect and respect for Cuba's self-determination without US interference. Over the last year, we have built the strongest Cuba solidarity movement under uh, the Alliance of US-Cuba Normalization, along with Canadians, uh, and um, to, to, to lift the six-year-old block, blockade. Uh, there is a new alliance called ASERE, which means friend in Cuban Spanish, that will be coordinating lobby efforts. And we hope that you will join us in lobbying our congressional delegation to support legislative bills to tear down that U.S. blockade. As I said, it will take an act of Congress. The president can do certain things like opening up travel, um, initiating some uh, economic trade but it's only Congress that can lift the blockade. <clears throat> only Congress can completely lift the blockade that will open up economic trade and stopping. We have to stop the funding and using US monies to fund counter-revolutionary movements in Cuba that is meant to overthrow and destabilize the Cuban government. And that, that is our tax money being used. Second, second we have a campaign called Saving Lives Campaign that calls for US-Cuba cooperation in the fight against COVID-19. We know that our country is, is the worst in terms of statistics around COVID-19 and in particular the impact on communities of color, uh, especially in the Latino community, the Latinx community, African-American community, and especially the indigenous communities. 
We can learn so much about Cuba's healthcare system, which is absolutely free, and why they only have 1.3 deaths per 100,000 to our ratio in the United States, which is 110 deaths per 100,000. Mm -hmm. And um, because the pandemic is one of a global nature, we can, we can see how we, how we need to restructure our healthcare system to take care of people during this pandemic. Uh, we can utilize the, vac the vaccines that they are developing as well as their medications um, and as well as their preventative me measures in terms of alternative medicine. And you can go to uh, the campaign at savinglivesus dash cubanormalization.org, or you can contact me at cindydomingo uh, at gmail.com. And um, if you want to become active in the Cuba Solidarity Movement, there are a number of organizations. Uh, if you live in Seattle, the Seattle Cuba Friendship Committee, uh, my organization, which is US Women and Cuba Collaboration. And uh, there are hopefully as uh, as we deal with the pandemic, uh, the and if we can open up travel to Cuba once again this year, there will be a number of organizations doing delegations, the Vince Ramos Brigade that Sophia used to work with, Pastors for Peace, U.S. Women in Cuba Collaboration, Code Pink, but many of these may be put on hold uh, until the pandemic subsides. So I want to thank you again, uh, Yannette Pumariaga, Sophia Elijah, my friend Aaron Dixon, who I'll take to Cuba with me. Yeah, I'm going to hold you up to that now. <laughs> and, uh, Alini Prata, um, and especially uh, Katie, who has organized these workshops for the MLK Day celebration and rally for four years and made a successful switch to this year to virtual workshops, which have been overwhelmingly successful. Um, and I wanna thank you all again for coming, your time and contributions. We hope we continue to work together to change both our domestic policies and our US foreign policies because they are so connected.